want to give you a little bit of context about why transit is a key climate solution, specifically in Virginia. So we actually just a couple months ago got the data back from 2021 about where our emissions come from by sector, and more than half of it is from transportation. Uh, the vast majority majority of these emissions, uh, usually something on the order of 70%, are from personal vehicles. And that's more than the entire power sector. So all of the coal, gas, generate, uh, fired facilities combined. Um, truly, if we are moving towards a zero carbon future, uh, while we're supporting policies to electrify vehicles, we understand that's going to take time. We understand for now and probably for some time, it's going to be cost prohibitive for some people. So not only to promote mobility around our, com our communities, but also just as a climate solution, the quickest way to begin decarbonizing our biggest emitting sector is through reducing vehicle miles traveled. Um, next slide, please. Cool. So something uh, that has been a great tool for starting to shift the paradigm in Virginia around transportation is something called Smart Scale. Smart Scale has been around since about 2016, I think, and essentially it's a data analytics tool that Virginia's agencies use to then fund transportation projects. Um, so Smart Scale proposed projects will, will go through the algorithm and they will spit out a score that measures the project um, on things like congestion mitigation, safety improvement, environmental benefits, et cetera. And then projects that score high get prioritized for funding. And this has resulted in a lot of great projects getting funded. And it's resulted in a lot of uh, biking and pedestrian infrastructure projects getting funded in particular, as well as transit projects. Uh, put here on the slide, you know, we've won multiple awards in Virginia for smart scale because it's been so effective at doing what it's supposed to do, which is reduce con congestion, increase safety, and provide environmental benefits. Some of the projects uh, that I wanted to shout out from the regions that we work in that have been funded through smart scale, most of which would not have been funded uh, if, uh, if we changed smart scale to some of the proposed changes I'm about to describe, are a commuter bus service in between Windsor and Suffolk in Hampton Roads, the Appomattox uh, River Greenway Trail, uh, the Norfolk Bicycle and Pedestrian Improvement Project, the Broad Street Pulse BRT expansion in Richmond, a shared use path in Manassas, the uh, George Snyder Trail Eastern Extension in Fairfax. These are all amazing projects that increase mobility around our communities, also reducing emissions that probably would not be complete or, or uh, some of them are complete, but would not be being worked on right now if we didn't have the smart scale formula that we currently have. Uh, next slide, please. Unfortunately, um, right now, the Commonwealth Transportation Board is considering changing smart scale in ways that we think are ultimately going to be really harmful for mobility as well as for climate. Uh, some of the proposed changes would force uh, smart scale to score major road projects as high priority. So that would ultimately divert funds away from bike and pedestrian infrastructure and transit and continue to lock in car dependence and all of the inequities that come with it. Um, this hasn't really been a public process at all. Much of this has happened just as deliberations with the board and some uh, uh, some localities, but we want there to be an opportunity for the public to weigh in on what's happening right now. And, uh, you know, I want to be clear that this is this is taxpayer money, so it's your money. So through the LTE process today, uh, we want to make sure that you are able to uh, make your voice heard with uh, not only your Commonwealth Transportation Board or CTB rep, but also your state delegate and senator. So you can show them that transit should be a priority as, we, as we're looking at a budget year coming up. Um, and ultimately that biking, walking and transit uh, are climate solutions, uh, are mobility solutions and need to be prioritized when we think about how we're gonna spend our state dollars in Virginia. And I'm passing it to Bruce. Thanks, Bruce. Okay, thank you. Hey, I am Bruce Doris. Um, I'm here to speak about writing letters to the editor. Frankly, I can't even do that in my hometown anymore. Stanton doesn't no longer publishes letters to the editor. They don't have enough staff. 
So if you still can, that's fantastic. And even if you can't, if you use social media, it's one way to help spread the message about what's going on. So um, given some thought to things that might be helpful to you, I would like to add that if you don't get anything from this and what I have to say, then simply Google how to write letters to the editor and maybe put Bill McKibben, my hero, how to write letters to the editor or uh, Catholic Relief Service has a wonderful website on how to do this. What you're gonna get from me is just, um, a lot of it's based on my experience um, and having written columns for 15 years, some of the things that work in columns also write in uh, work in letters to the editor. So first, get it off to a solid, interesting start. If you can't, that's okay. If you don't have a, a hook that really uh, motivates people to want to tune in for more of the message, it's still okay. Especially if you can reference in that first sentence <clears throat> information about a recently published article in whatever you're sent, wherever you're sending a letter to the editor, they, they've done something about transportation, <clears throat> anything close to this topic. Use that as a way to wedge yourself into the dis discussion, saying something like, I really appreciate the fact that you did a letter about smart scale. And you can put it in, in probably more interesting language than that. But if you can, you also want to have a sentence before that. Um, something that might be catchy in some way, wordplay. For example, the words scale and smart. We can get smarter with our transportation future if we rescale where we put the environment in our planning, something like that. Or <clears throat> just take a look at the, the website for smart scale. And there are phrases like, um, keep Virginia moving in the right direction. Use that and turn it and twist it to your purpose because it's just a perfect setup for the argument you, you're gonna wanna make. Or um, Virginia is for lovers, that wonderful cliche public relations campaign. <clears throat> turn it to Virginia is for lovers, not, not what? What is it you're gonna be saying needs to be changed or not done? In fact, on the website, it says not for litter, but use it for your purposes. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so the hook, the hook is important, but don't worry about it if you're stuck. <clears throat> Pardon me. So after you've gotten the editor's attention, by the way, your audience is an editor and they're human beings and they don't wanna be attacked. <laughs> they also don't, don't wanna have to work hard. So make your language clear, correct, have somebody proofread it before you send it so they're not struggling to figure out what's going on, what you're trying to do. So next, you want to move into the problem. In this case, it's the concerns about what will revising smart scale mean for the state and for us and for the future. Um, one of the things I'm up, I'm not really fond of are, are funds that go into highways and interstates. Um, I grew up in Houston, Texas, maybe the concrete capital of the universe. Maybe I'd mention, I don't wanna see my air, my state now going the direction of Texas with its uh, abusive, its retrograde transportation planning. <clears throat> so you wanna lay out the problem. You don't wanna lay out a bunch of problems. You're not gonna try and do a, what's called a kitchen sink argument where you list a bunch of issues that you think need to be addressed. Stick with your best, maybe two, and focus on those. Um, you gotta have evidence for what you want to argue. So what are, what are maybe some things that you've had experience with in your background that suggests we need to stay away from, from still more highways or provide more public transportation or more bike paths? If you have a story, a short story, by that I mean 50 words or so, you can get it across. Then tell that story as part of your evidence. Make it a personal argument. And then part four is, what is it you want the state of Virginia or smart scale, the folks on that transportation board, what do you want them to do going forward? 
in very short, very clear, concise language. <clears throat> so I've taught media for a long time. At this point, I would take questions, but I'm gonna go ahead and jump into just a few more ideas and then see if you have questions. Um, so again, you wanna make sure in media writing being correct, there's something like seven or eight different C's of media writing. I'm gonna talk about some of the C's of media writing. One of the C's is make sure it's correct. Make sure your proof is credible. It comes from a good source. And if you can mention the source of the, of the information or argument, that's a good thing. Um, you also wanna make sure that, again, you've had a proofreader look at it to make sure your evidence is clear and your grammar and all the rest of that stuff is correct. A uh, letter to the editor should probably be no more than 300 words, better if it's 250 words. Usually that's in three paragraphs. One sentence paragraphs are fine in media writing. They make good transitions sometimes or in that hook. You wanna to connect to the audience. Now again, your first audience is the editors making choices about whether or not you're gonna get published, but they're serving their readers. So you wanna make sure you're addressing concerns that are gonna be of interest, not just to you, but for the people who are consuming the media. Uh, it's, let's see. I wanted to say, I heard a writer, a social activist, Naomi Klein, this week talk about her latest book. And she mentioned the fact that right now in, in time in media, civility is subversive. There's so much bile and hatred and anger. When you can show the people, the editors, the Board of Transportation, everybody some civility and understanding and thankfulness even, if it's appropriate, that's a really sharp thing to do because the message is more likely gonna cut through some of the clutter. Right now, I think that there's more power in being calm than in being clever or going on the attack but i guess the the last thing i'd close with is uh the the system used to gauge these projects where the money goes puts the environment last the climate and the environment come after other criteria at least that's my reading of how they're measuring this and that's something to maybe close with because <clears throat> you need strong closure. A sentence or two that tells the readers, the editors, the readers, this has come to the end and this is something I really want to stick with you. What I've said before matters. And one of the reasons it really matters is because we've been putting the environment and the climate last in our considerations about transportation. So do we turn it over to questions or what do we do at this point? Thank you so much, Bruce. I think we have like two more quick slides uh, to talk through on LTE. So if you don't mind, please go into the next slide, please. Yeah, so this is this is Bruce. Bruce has already presented uh, on these points, but you, you want to really pick one or two powerful angles and include uh, evidence to support those angles. But again, choosing sort of one uh, to tops two narratives is going to be uh, more uh, persuasive. And then you do want to link to whatever your source is. They may not actually publish the link, but the editor wants to know that you're giving them good information. Uh, next slide, please. And then again, Bruce has said this, so we're, we're backtracking a little bit here, but the most powerful and most likely to be published LTEs are ones that are really personal, that talk about your experience in your community, and why uh, the whatever topic that you're discussing at that moment affects your life and your neighbors. Um, so do connect the issue to your personal life, paint a picture of how these proposed changes may affect you and your neighbors, and that's gonna be a more persuasive uh, letter to the editor. And Victoria? And, yes. Could you go back? Um, the last, oh, yeah. last bullet point says right from the heart. <clears throat> you're writing from three places, the head, the heart, and really the stomach. You're, you're developing an argument that's based on logos, logic, data, prove it, show it. But there's also the heart, what feeling you're trying to convey to the recipient 
And then credibility is built on, is it well-written? It doesn't have to be prose, it just needs to be clear, concise, little color and correct. And that'll add to the three, <clears throat> the three pronged approach to persuasion, head, heart, guts. Next. Awesome. And I think we've talked through this um, so we can probably uh, move through these. Yes, uh, you're, you're issuing a call to action through your LTE. Uh, next slide, please. Cool. So here's what you're going to do after you've written. One, congratulate yourself. You wrote a letter to the editor. That's awesome. Um, so after you're taking your moment of celebration, which can extend into the night, feel free. Uh, do submit your LTE to your local paper. So get it in today. Um, you may get a call tomorrow or the next day to confirm it's from you, which is a good sign that they're going to publish it. But if you don't hear from them within uh, about 48 hours, 36 hours, then do either uh, send them an email to the opinion desk, or if you have the number, um, then you can give them a quick call and just make sure that they received it and ask if they plan to publish it. If not, that's okay. Uh, you can still, whether or not you are successful with your letter, with uh, getting your letter published, you can send it to your uh, Commonwealth Transportation Board rep, and I will give you the link right here, and we're going to include this all in the follow-up. So don't worry uh, if you are waiting on instructions, we will give them to you for who to follow up with. So I'm putting this in the chat right now. These are the board members. Uh, you may notice it's a homogenous bunch, which is its own problem. Um, but then also send it to your state delegate and state senator. They don't have decision-making power here, but they can, they can influence these board members. And importantly, we're heading, as I said, into the legislative session where we're going to be doing a whole new state budget. So they need to hear that transit is a priority uh, for Virginians, whether or not these proposed changes are successful. There's a lot we can do to advocate for funding transit, biking and walking infrastructure as we go into the new year. Um, and then this isn't on the slide, but also consider sending it to your locality. They've been some of the most powerful allies actually uh, against uh, these proposed changes. So your, your city council rep or your board of supervisors rep, uh, definitely also consider sending it to them. Basically just get out your message to folks Hopefully it's posted, but even if it's not, um, it's good for them to know that there are civically engaged folks uh, in their community that are really concerned about this. Um, I'm linking here just to one that I uh, published recently um, in the Richmond Times Dispatch, and I'll give that's the link. But if you don't uh, have a um, if you don't have a subscription, I can also get it up on. Uh, I'll follow up in a, in a minute or two with a link to just a Google Doc with the text. Um, so just an example uh, to pull from if that is helpful for you as we move into uh, actually writing these. 